So hi, Tina. It's hi, so nice to be with you. Um, we're here for our Women Waging Peace series, and you and I first met at the Santa Barbara Film Festival for the screening of your new film, First Day Bomb New Mexico. And for me, this movie was absolutely eye-opening. I went into the theater believing that I knew about some of the downwind consequences in New Mexico, and I realized just I left in shock at how much I really didn't know, despite working in the field of disarmament and despite studying international relations and sustainability in college for over four years. Um, and I really want to make sure that your message gets out to as many people as possible, because this is an intrinsic part of U.S. history, and it just has to be better known. And I'm also so inspired by your decades long work and your dedication to your community, to justice, and just to creating a more equitable world overall. Um, <laughs> I'd like to introduce yourself. So my name is Tina Cordova, and um, I am a native New Mexican. I've lived in New Mexico all my life. I am um, a downwinder and a cancer survivor. I'm the fourth generation in my family to have cancer since 1945. And now we have five generations because I have um, a 24 year old niece that was diagnosed at the age of 23 with thyroid cancer the same way I was diagnosed. Um, but I was diagnosed at 39. <clears throat> and I am the co founder of an organization called the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium. And we've been working for 19 years to bring attention to the negative health effects suffered by the people of New Mexico as a result of being overexposed to radiation when they detonated the Trinity bomb adjacent to where we lived. Mm -hmm. I saw that in a previous interview, you talked about your work and the movie in particular as supporting the rest of the narrative that hasn't been told in regards to Oppenheimer. Can you talk about what Oppenheimer has and hasn't done and what really happened in New Mexico? Well, first of all, you know, this history has been in many ways suppressed and it's not a history that's well known mm -hmm. and it is absolutely a part of New Mexico history, American history and world history because our lives were changed forever after Trinity. Um, we have never lived a day without the threat of a nuclear exchange with a rogue nuclear armed country and and so it's world history. And what happened in New Mexico is that they detonated the bomb. Well, what happened in New Mexico is that they came here, they invaded our lands and our lives, they destroyed our environment, and then they left. And we were essentially collateral damage to the Manhattan Project. The government made huge mistakes. Uh, they full well knew in advance of the detonation at Trinity that radiation was damaging to human health and very dangerous. They full well knew that the bomb was going to create fallout that would likely uh, affect many, many people across New Mexico. Um, and they still moved forward. We had ranching families that lived as close as 12 miles to the test site. They never warned anybody before or afterwards, and they gave us no opportunity to protect ourselves. Above and beyond that, they also have never returned to fully um, explore what happened to us as human beings being overexposed to radiation. So there's never been an epidemiological study or anything like that that would actually address what really took place to the population, the people who were, we were essentially uh, living farm to table in 1945. We didn't have running water. We didn't have grocery stores, um, et cetera. And so we were maximally exposed. And then when they came here to film the Oppenheimer movie, we're in an exceedingly poor state. We're the state most dependent on Medicaid of any state in the country. Um, we have a little over 2 million people living here and we're carrying $881 million in medical debt, a billion dollars in medical debt. Um, they came here, they took our tax incentives, they invaded our lands and our lives, used our local very well prepared and capable workforce, filmed a blockbuster movie that will gross more than a billion dollars worldwide, and they've never acknowledged a single thing about 
the sacrifice and the suffering of the people of New Mexico as part of the Manhattan Project and the Trinity bomb. And even now, um, when I know that they have to know about us because I've been interviewed countless times, there's been a lot written <clears throat> about first we bombed New Mexico, the documentary, mm -hmm. and they still refuse to acknowledge or accept um, support for the film, support for the downwinders, support for the people in New Mexico that have been dying ever since the bomb was detonated here, developed and detonated here. It's really shocking. And in my opinion, the way the movie portrays it, it just seems like it's a, a wasteland that no one lives in. Um, that's when I've talked to my friends who watch the movie, that's just, they, that, that's what they say. They're like, oh, but the way that they showed it, no one's lived there. So how do you think they were able to get away with just pretending that no one lived there when people, when they obviously knew that people did? And it's not like they didn't know that there was a rancher 12 miles away. And you talk about this, this work that a student of yours did um, with mapping the total population around the test site. Yeah, the idea that no one lived here and no one was harmed is a narrative that has been proposed by our government and presented by our government and supported by our government. And it's no wonder that Oppenheimer, the, ma the movie makers of Oppenheimer, uh, decided to also uh, develop a, a movie around that lie uh, because it's an out and out lie. The truth is when they came here to establish the Manhattan Project, they displaced the people off of their land on what was called the Pajarito Plateau. Mm -hmm. um, there were Native American and Mexican American, Hispanic Americans living there that had lived there for a very, very long time. And they displaced them. They made them leave. They burned their crops and slaughtered their animals and took their land and they were never able to recover from that, as you can well imagine. And then, you know, the Trinity site, they continue to say to this day that it was remote and uninhabited. No one lived here. No one was harmed. But we had a student at the University of New Mexico develop this map, um, which was monumental and an amazing project where he took a map of New Mexico, he laid out every one of the census tracts from 1940, because that was the closest census we had, and placed the numbers on the map very accurately, drew radiuses around Trinity at 10 mile increments, and within a 50 mile radius, there were 13,000 children, women, and men living adjacent to Trinity. If you extend that radius to 150 miles, there were half a million people living adjacent to Trinity because it encompassed Albuquerque and Santa Fe to the north and El Paso and Ciudad Juarez to the south. It encompassed the Arizona border to the west and almost to the Texas border to the east. So it was almost our whole state. And, you know, that is not remote and uninhabited. And it was a huge mistake to believe that they could do this and that no one would be harmed or that they just honestly didn't care if people were harmed. There's a story <clears throat> that I share sometimes to give people an idea of how little concern they had for us as human beings. Um, when the meteorologists were calling out General Groves and saying, we can't detonate a bomb in July in New Mexico because that's their rainy season. They get massive thunderstorms mm -hmm. and it's going to bring down the largest particles of radiation if we do that. And it'll be very dangerous. And especially because we didn't have running water, it would be very dangerous. <clears throat> and then you had physicians assigned to the test that were saying the same thing. If people get exposed to these high levels of radiation, some of them might die from that and some of them will be harmed permanently from that and they finally got general Go groves to consider um evacuating the town of carrizozo which was about 35 miles from the trinity site and we had active rail systems through all these small towns the railroads were already well established and they were actually a big part of the economy 
And so there was a railroad running through Carrizozo and Tularosa and Socorro and San Antonio. And instead of lining up rail cars outside of Carrizozo, they lined up cattle trucks. And I always tell people, we don't move cattle in July in New Mexico because it's too hot and there's not adequate ventilation. And so for me, what I visualize is my good friend, Bernice Gutierrez, who was born eight days before the bomb was detonated in Carrizozo. <clears throat> I visualize her mom wrapping her up as an eight day old baby, them being herded into a filthy cattle truck where there's no place for them to sit down. It's over 100 degrees outside and there's no ventilation and the roads were dirt roads and I visualize them being hauled out of there that way and to where I don't know. Um, but it, you know, it makes me sick to my stomach because I realized that they didn't value us at all as human beings. They didn't, they didn't care one way or the other. There's that um, <clears throat> interview in the movie with Daryl Gilmore, and he was a young college student driving across the desert that day, and he got radiation burns mm -hmm. to all of his body. And Daryl and I spoke many times on the phone. He's gone now, um, but he had survivor's guilt because even though he had multiple cancers, his father and mother both died from cancer. His sister died from cancer, and he felt like he had brought it home with him. And um, he, he used to tell me, why didn't they close that roadway off that day so that no one could drive across the desert? And, you know, that's the question. They didn't even care enough to close that roadway off. And there's points where you're just maybe, like I said, 12 to 15 miles away from the test site on that roadway. Mm -hmm. And he should have never been allowed to drive across there. You know, he suffered his whole life because of it. And, and I remember telling him, Daryl, you didn't bring radiation home. Radiation fell all over the town of Tularosa um, in those days afterwards. And that's what people remembered, Anastasia. They all remembered that they thought the world was ending. Um, many of them believed that, that the world was ending. And I remember one man telling me, my mom kept saying not to look at the fireball but I kept thinking, because she, she kept telling us the world was ending, and she was telling us to pray the rosary in Spanish. And he said, I kept thinking that if I was, if the world was ending, that God would have to come out from that fireball. And I kept looking at it, and he told me, my vision was never the same afterwards. Wow. And people were horribly affected. Without warning, innocent people going about their very very full but but you know very their lives were um very simple but very full they had everything they needed and and everything was destroyed after that yeah <clears throat> that the bomb should have never been tested but even if they were on this just unstoppable mission to test it there were so many simple things like you just mentioned that could have been done things that didn't cost anything to close down a road to put up a sign to send a letter telling people what's what would happen even though some of those things might have still exposed people to massive amounts of radiation at least that would have shown some some care i mean and it's really not that long ago it, no and they showed no no care or concern and i always say that this idea that they kept it top secret and they didn't share information with the locals because it had to be top secret. I think it's laughable because without electricity, we didn't have telephones, we didn't have televisions, we didn't have radios. We didn't have communication with the outside world. We read newspapers that were only printed, you know, weekly. Um, the only communication we had with each other was when we gathered together as families. Um, and it, the idea that we were going to share all of this far and wide is just insane <laughs> yeah absolutely um part of your film focuses a lot around the very specific legislation that you and your organization <laughs> have been working on to get compensation for victims in new mexico because of course the u.s has tested in other areas in nevada in the pacific islands 
and some of these communities have received some amounts of financial and health care compensation. But to my understanding, this has not been the case with the downwinders in New Mexico. Can you talk about the status of the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, what it is and what people really need to know about it? Well, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act was established in 1990, 34 years ago, and it was a bipartisan effort to take care of people who were harmed because of the above ground testing that took place at Nevada. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually started with efforts by Secretary Udall, who was Secretary of the Interior. And when he retired, he moved back to Utah and people started to approach him because he was an attorney about their the damage that they had suffered as a result of being exposed to radiation, they believed from the testing in Nevada and he started to take a look at these things and uncover a lot of information and he started filing claims not only on behalf of the downwinders in parts of Nevada, Arizona and Utah, but also uranium workers and he was winning these claims in the court system all the way to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals, but at every level they would say that it was in the interest of national security so they would not award damages. Stuart Udall fought this battle almost to the point of bankrupting himself, and then he realized that the only resolve would be a political resolve, and so he went to Orrin Hatch, a Republican senator from Utah, and Ted Kennedy, a Democratic senator from Massachusetts, and they established the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. Why New Mexico was left out is, I always say, the, you know, $2.6 billion question, because We'll never know the answer. If there was an admission of harm around the Nevada test site and those that were exposed to radiation then, how could that not also be assumed for the people of New Mexico who were exposed to uh, a much more fallout producing bomb than was ever, ever, ever detonated again? Um, the bomb at Trinity, because it was the first of its kind, was completely completely inefficient. It was overpacked with plutonium. More than 10 pounds of plutonium went up in the fireball that came down as a radioactive ash for days afterwards. It was uh, detonated so close to the ground that it really didn't produce destruction. It just produced massive fallout. They actually determined at Trinity that in Japan to create destruction, they would have to detonate those bombs higher in the atmosphere. So at Trinity, it was detonated 100 feet off the ground. But in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, those bombs were detonated at between 1600 and 1800 feet. And so those bombs created mass destruction and much less fallout. The bombs that, that were tested in Nevada uh, were quite different from Trinity because they already learned that the fallout was, was obviously not uh, OK because they knew that they had harmed people. And so, like I said, for them to uh, um, presume that people were affected at Nevada and not have the same presumption about the people in New Mexico is just unimaginable. And so we've never been included. We've never, we've never received any kind of assistance from our government for 78 years. And people have been dying ever since, and complete families have been wiped out. And this is a multi generational problem that's not going to go away from us. When they, when they detonated this bomb here and exposed us to high level of rate, high levels of radiation, they destined those people who were alive at the time to a life of sacrifice and suffering, and then they further destined. Every, every generation after that to the same thing. And so I always tell people, you know, they not only harmed us and those of us who were alive at the time, they harmed those of us who came afterwards forevermore because we carry that genetic footprint and there's no shedding that. And aside from the fact that plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years and is likely spread all over New Mexico as a result of the bomb at Trinity, and not just the bomb at Trinity, but all of the development work that took place at Los Alamos, and they just freely dumped the waste in the canyons around there, which becomes part of 
the uh, watershed for most of New Mexico. And they, they have maps now. I just saw a map within the last three days of where they have found plutonium wow. in New Mexico uh, associated with the development of bombs from Los Alamos. And it's, it's unimaginable. It's everywhere, you know? So we've, we, our destiny was set and not just our destiny, but the destiny of everybody to come. So with that, with Rika, is, are there any updates? Is so Rika recently. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. So Rika <clears throat> in March, the most amazing thing happened. We had a standalone bill introduced in the Senate by Senator Lujan, uh, Senator Hawley, Senator Crapo bipartisan it received a vote of 69 to 30, which just never happens these days in the US Senate. We were very um, enthused about what the possibility might be to get the bill passed before Rika sunsets in June of this year. So in just a few short months, but the House hasn't taken up the bill. Um, we don't know whether Speaker Johnson will see to it that it ever sees the light of day on the House floor. But we think that if he would bring it up for a vote, it would have enough bipartisan support that it would pass. The problem, the problem with this is that there are still Republican, primarily Republican members of Congress in both the Senate and the House who believe it's going to cost too much to not only add the people of New Mexico, the downwinders of New Mexico and the post 71 uranium workers, but the downwinders across the American West and Guam who've never been added or taken care of. And we, we know that that is not reality. <laughs> we spend $50 billion a year just maintaining our nuclear arsenal. We've constructed this pie chart that actually addresses what we've spent, which is close to $10 trillion through the nuclear program, program's inception. And we've spent $2.6 billion taking care of the American citizens that were bombed by our own government. And so when you take a look at 2.6 billion versus 10 trillion or the 50 billion that they say it's gonna to cost to pass this bill, you realize that that is just a total fallacy, that there's no truth to the fact that it's gonna to cost too much. You have to ask yourself how anyone could consider this moral to me, it seems completely and totally immoral that our government, who is supposed to look after us, take care of us, protect us, actually bombed us, relegated us to collateral damage, refused to accept the idea that we should be taken care of and leave us alone to deal with this. I mean, the $50 billion that you just mentioned, that's not even for any modernization plans for the nuclear arsenals. That's just to maintain them as they are. And just to completely just to maintain them as they are, put them to bed every night. We're maintaining weapons that we promise we'll never use again. And yet even, and clearly it's not too much. We just sent over $80 billion in foreign aid abroad, but in some even if there wasn't money, which clearly there is, you have a population that has been directly harmed by the actions of the US federal government that they are mandated to, to attend to that. There's no, you, you, you would find the money regardless. That's just how, how things work. I, you mentioned in an interview one time, it's you break it, you fix it. That's, that's what you do. And it doesn't matter how much it would cost. And I mean, it's just astonishing the fact that it's been so long. And even the fact that RICA only came about in the 1990s. So in, in these other areas, people were also suffering for over almost 50 years without any compensation. Um, yeah. And, you know, one of the things I say these days is that to me, it's shockingly immoral um, that our government is able to say to us that it's going to cost too much. And our country is based on law and order mm -hmm. and you know, we, we are all responsible for our actions and you and I couldn't go out there and recklessly harm people. 
and then when we're held to account say something like oh i don't want to put my resources to that because it's going to cost too much mm -hmm. we could never ever use that as an excuse and for the government to use that excuse now um is just shockingly immoral i have a I have to deliver a eulogy tomorrow at a funeral for a cousin of mine who was diagnosed with cancer around April 5th and she passed away on April 21st. And it just, it's part of our lives. It's how we live. I always say we bury somebody and then somebody else is diagnosed. And it's our children now more than uh, tr so troubling because you know, those people who were children at the time of the bomb, like my father and others, they're gone. Their generation is wiped out. They, they received exceedingly high doses because they were small children. And, and now what we're seeing is that it's the disease is manifesting in younger kids all the time. I mean, I was home last year in May in Tularosa, and I was staying with a cousin of mine and he had a postcard on his table that I looked at and it was a little girl and it said something like, thank you for all your support. And so I said, what is this? And he said, you know, do you remember so-and-so? And I was like, yes. And he said, that's his granddaughter and she has eye cancer and she lost an eye to cancer and her other eye is at risk. And everybody in Tularosa, we held fundraisers to raise enough money so they could get the health care she needed and um they sent out that postcard to thank everyone and i was like you know what this is pathetic we hold bake sales and garage sales and enchilada suppers so that we can raise the money to take care of each other because we have no other choice you know we've been taking care of each other for 78 years the government's been glad to give us this responsibility on top of harming us they've been glad to say this is yours to deal with. And I can think of nothing more immoral than that. Yeah, and even pushing it to another con congressional cycle as if it's just any other bill, like, you know, a road that needs to be built. Oh, we can just push that to next year. What if people are dealing with this every single day? I absolutely love that analogy that you just, that you just used. You know, kick the can down the road. We're not, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, these are human beings. These are not projects that can wait for funding. Mm -hmm. You know, it has affected us in ways that I cannot completely and adequately describe. Um, I always tell everybody there's the physiological medical consequences, right? But there's also emotional and psychological consequences, and there's financial consequences. And we will never fully understand or know how negatively this has affected us because, you know, how do you do that study? And especially this many years later, we can never find everybody that's died. We can never account for everybody that's died. And um, yeah, to just say, here's a hundred thousand dollars. Well, right now the program only awards $50,000, but to say, here's $50,000, um, have a nice life is, I don't know, it's just unconscionable and it's, it's our government at, at its worst. Um, say that you, this Riga ends up including New Mexico, which I really believe that with your work, it will, um, what would you see as the next, the next step in holistically addressing what's been done in New Mexico? You know, people ask me about that all the time. You know, what does healing look like for all of you? I don't know that you ever completely heal from something like this. Money's not going to make it better. You know, I miss my dad all the time and my mom should not be a widow. And I was, you know, I was in uh, Southern New Mexico for a film festival recently and an uncle of mine, his wife was my mom's sister, my aunt. And my aunt, she just finished going through cancer treatment, but her husband died. And my uncle, you know, my aunt died. So I had an uncle who's lost a wife and an aunt who's lost a husband and also is a cancer survivor. And her, hus her, 
her son now has cancer and we're sitting around the table talking about the documentary and my uncle said something like i just be grateful if they apologize for what they did and i said no no that's not good enough an apology you know we deserve an apology but you should not be a widower and you should not be a widow you know your your spouse has died way too young and left you all to live alone to never be able to contribute again to your family to never be able to attend graduations and weddings and all the other things that you guys have had to attend alone an apology is not good enough the money that they give us won't be good enough either but at least it makes me feel like there's some level of reparation like there's an effort to make reparations mm -hmm. like we weren't just taken for granted like yeah. some, somehow we did matter enough for our government to say we're sorry but we also want to contribute something to your family for all that was taken away yeah and i can only imagine the negative health impacts that are probably brought on with increased financial stress about how to pay medical bills and just keep keep your life afloat when you can't work anymore because you have cancer and so yeah i i do think it would go so far just in allowing people to maintain some semblance of normalcy even though this was this is never normal and would never be normal and you know speaking to that very quickly let me just say that i've had people tell me I wish I would die so I wouldn't be a burden to my family anymore because every day we just rack up more debt and more debt. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't get to develop generational wealth. What we do is we end up spending everything we have and more at the end of our lives. And then our families aren't left with any kind of generational wealth mm -hmm. or anything of value. And it has many social negative consequences a lot there's a person on, on our steering committee that reminds us it's probably contributed to alcohol abuse drug abuse divorce we know it's contributed to the filing of bankruptcy mm -hmm. and we see the poverty the stark poverty in these communities that are closest to trinity it's it's unbelievable we've gone door to door in in these communities and we've seen the stark poverty that people are living in. And so, you know, yes, that money is never going to bring back the loss of a loved one, but what it could do is restore some of the the damage that was left afterwards. Absolutely. There's another question I really want to ask you because it seems like you have a very unique perspective on it. So in the name of sustainability, a lot of advocates um, have been pushing for nuclear energy development worldwide. And sometimes it feels easier to separate nuclear weapons and nuclear energy just because of how popular nuclear energy tends to be, especially in countries like France. Um, but really in the US as well, we have the highest output of nuclear energy, even though it's a lower percentage of our total energy production. And in your film, you draw a very close connection between the two. Um, and that connection is the mining of uranium. Can you expand on the significance of this and what the dangers are of uranium mining um, and how workers become affected and how no matter how you know safe you claim the, the technology of the nuclear plant is, you will always need the uranium to be mined and those negative environmental and health impacts will always exist. Well, you know, <laughs> New Mexico, the people of New Mexico have been the victims of the cradle to grave process. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's any other place where, that, where you could go. I know there's no other place like this in the United States where you could go and you could see the harm that was done from the cradle, which is the extraction of uranium through the development and testing of nuclear devices through to the end, which is the storage of nuclear waste. The nuclear cycle requires that interface from the cradle to the grave. And <clears throat> currently we don't have a place to store high level nuclear waste. We don't have a permanent repository. 
And New Mexico is under consideration for a high level waste facility, even though we don't have a we don't have a power plant here, a nuclear power plant here. We don't see the benefit of the production of that electricity. And I always say to people, um, if you want to see the whole life cycle come to New Mexico, because when you go to those communities that had uranium mining, what you see is death and what you see is illness and what you see is sickness and poverty. <clears throat> and then you go to the communities that are downwind and you see the same thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they're going to tell us that it's safe and seemingly it is up until the moment it's not. And then it's catastrophic and no one comes back. And New Mexico is also a very good example of that. You know, the idea of bringing high level waste here on rail cars, we just had this massive derailment in Western New Mexico last week and these trains burned for days. And, you know, I can just hear, <laughs> I can just hear what they would tell us. Well, theoretically those casks should have held up and uh, yeah, we're really sorry that now, you know, we've released plutonium all over New Mexico in this fire. Uh, there is no way that we can accept this on behalf of those to come after us. And I just think that the reality is not known by most people of mm -hmm. what the nuclear cycle looks like when, when there is exposure to radiation at some step. So what I see with the uranium workers is exactly what I see in the downwind communities. You know, people are suffering with all sorts of lung disease, cancer, all sorts of kidney disease, uh, renal failure, they're on dialysis. They're, I always tell everybody, you know, it's the reason we had such high death rates in the Navajo Nation during COVID, because these people had underlying health problems associated with uranium mining and the waste. We have all these Superfund sites all across the Navajo Nation, Laguna and Acoma Pueblo that the government's never addressed. So these people are still inhaling tailings, the dust from the tailings, the water is contaminated. You know, they find uranium in the urine of babies. And so, you know, what did they think was gonna happen? And, and that's why I say, you know, if somebody wants to understand the whole cycle they should come here and go to Laguna Pueblo and talk to the people who are dying or have died. Uh, go, you know, to any of these downwind communities and speak to the families who have lost many, many family members to cancer, of, you know, and, and try and understand what it looks like. Because to accept any use of radiation uh, I mean, of, of nuclear, to accept any uh, use, like I, I tell people all the time, this idea of a limited use of nuclear weapons is so frightening to me because you may survive, but that doesn't mean it's not the beginning of the end for you because it has been for us. And so for me, um, we've never approached these things with abundance of caution. <laughs> and like I said, it's safe until the moment it's not, and then it's catastrophic and nobody comes back. Industry will never come back. Anastasia, industry will file bankruptcy and move on, change the name of the company, you know, and that's what happened with uranium mining in New Mexico. You know, the government said after 1971, Uranium became commercially available, so we're not going to take care of people anymore, and we'll leave it up to industry. Well, industry never has taken care of anyone. That's not how they make money. And so they packed up, they left. They were never held to account. We have super fun sites that have never been addressed, and children are being raised adjacent to them. Mm -hmm. Little native children, little Hispanic, Mexican American children, and nobody cares. So don't count on anyone to come back. Yeah, clean energy, clean energy sounds great until you think about the full cycle. And clearly no community in the U.S. wants this kind of depository. Yucca Mountain in Nevada has been on hold for more than a decade. And it's just shocking to me how we can continue to advocate for 
the modernization and the increased development of nuclear energy when we don't even have a solution for the waste yet. Um, it's almost exactly like you described the bombing. It's like we will just, it's thinking about, we'll think about the after effects when they come around. But right now we're just going to think about the construction of these plants. I want to ask you a more difficult question. Um, I haven't heard you talk about this, but it's just, it's been on my mind. Um, you mentioned one time that if the, the people living in New Mexico during the time of the test had been made of wear, many mothers, many fathers would have taken their children and left and prevented them from being exposed to radiation. And since the, the half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years, as you mentioned, there's still radiation everywhere. Why do people continue to choose to live in communities that they know are heavily radiated? We are a place-based people. I always tell everybody um, when they ask me about this, I always say to people, White Sands National Monument, which is probably 30 miles away, the crows fly from the community I was raised in, unless it's probably much closer than 30 miles. It's, it interfaces with the Trinity site, with the White Sands Missile Range. They found the oldest footprints in the world there a few years ago, 23,000 year old footprints. And I tell everybody, it's hard to describe to people what place-based people are like, but we are tied to this place. I love New Mexico. I love everything about New Mexico, except that we have been a sacrifice zone. We, we never, we never moved any place or changed anything or went after anybody or invaded anybody or, you know, we didn't arm ourselves against the government and we were peaceful people living very, you know, simple but full lives. And I always say to everybody, honestly, the only safe day to move was July 15th, 1945. Because for most people, just living that day out, July 16th, and any day afterwards, you were exposed to radiation, and it likely was already making its way into your body. But having said all that, the, gov the government should have absolutely come back and said to people, this was a bomb that released radiation, and exposure to radiation means X. Mm -hmm. because they never did that they never explained and there's a real well-known story in the history about how they went to check on this one family that lived exceedingly close and they knew that they lived in maybe the hottest spot of where the fallout went it was called hot canyon and they sent some guys out there in tyvek tyvex with rudimentary geiger counters and when the rancher asked them what are you doing? And they said, we're checking for radiation. He said, you won't find any here because we don't own a radio. And so it was that they counted on us to be unsophisticated, uneducated, and unable to stand up for ourselves. And they left us here to deal with this. And a lot of times I tell people, we didn't have the resources to go. We didn't have First of all, we didn't have the understanding that made us aware that it was important to leave. We didn't, you know, in the documentary, my mom says, if they had told us, my husband and I would have moved our kids and left, but they didn't even give us that opportunity to understand what it meant, to realize that it was dangerous, uh, to, to have any of those sorts of opportunities to protect ourselves. <laughs> So that to me makes this much more egregious. Mm -hmm. um, there was a total lack of concern for us as human beings to not even educate us on what it meant to not even come back and say, to, to bring in safe water and safe food, to do anything. They did nothing. Yeah. Every and, so, and so I always tell people, we shouldn't have had to move, but 
facing the dis decision to move, I think some people would have made the choice if they had understood what it meant, mm -hmm. even though we're so tied to New Mexico. You know, I still hunt and fish and um, I, I do it much more cautiously than when I was younger. Um, I just think it's terrible because these were all things that were part of how we were raised. And somebody asked me recently, because I can, um, fruits, I make jams and jellies and spreads. And somebody told me, do you think it's safe? And I said, I don't know, but it's too late for us. <laughs> We've been exposed our whole lives. Do I mean, why would I take precautions now? It just seems useless now. <laughs> I'm, I've lived my whole life in this. That's a really scary thought. And it's it's also insane that every every negative impact that you've just described, the the New Mexico community has just basically had to figure that out for themselves. Like every the fact that it's better not to drink water out of the cistern and that this type of cancer will arise. And that's all just been on the job learning. It, none of it was was told ahead of time. None of it. Um I want to be mindful of the time. I just have one more question. Um, at the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, there's we have we're tied with affected communities around the world. For young people doing this work, whether they're from an affected community or not, what advice would you give? What work do you think needs to be done to ensure that another nuclear weapon is never used again? You know, when I see what's going on on college campuses today, as we're talking, I think to myself that I wish there was the same sort of um, emotion around the nuclear arms race that we're already in the middle of. Young people have got to open their eyes to the idea that we're in the middle of a nuclear arms race again. Our government's gonna test nuclear devices in the Nevada desert. They're already gearing up to do it. Um, there's been newspaper articles in the local newspaper about how Sandia Labs is creating all the infrastructure for the testing that they're going to do at Nevada. And Los Alamos has been talking to, they've had an article recently about Los Alamos and the part they're going to play. And they're building plutonium pits and it's gonna cost trillions of dollars to do this and we're gonna modernize and we're gonna do this. And I always tell everybody, the average person is not aware that we're in the middle of a nuclear arms race. Russia exited the test ban treaty. The United States is gonna start testing. They don't, they don't, I don't, I almost feel like our government is thinking they don't have a choice because if one flexes their muscle, the other has to flex their muscle. And it's ridiculous. It's because it's insanity. The There's no winners. People. There's no winners, and um, I wish that young people would would walk in the streets of the United States with posters that communicated how we can't go there, how we we don't want to see our government spend our money this way. Where you know we need to work for peace. We got a nuclear ban treaty because of advocates like me. These mothers knew that their kids were suffering rare cancers because of the above ground testing. And so they invited mothers from across the country to turn in their children's teeth when they shed them as babies. And they started looking at these teeth and they found that they had strontium in them and when they made President Kennedy aware of that, he he said, we can't continue to do this. And he got together with, you know, uh, Khrushchev mm -hmm. in Russia, and he said, we have to we have to stop. This is insanity. Our children are now displaying radiation in their teeth. And I remember, well, you can read the speech and there's a line in the speech, and I won't get it exactly right, but he said something to the effect of, even if only one child dies as a result of testing, it's one child too many because it's not natural. 
And, you know, that's, that's the reality. The world that young people are going to have to lead and um, contribute to is in a very precarious place. You know, and I, I don't feel like I'm an, an alarmist. I just feel like I'm a realist and my realism is based in my own life's experience with all of this. There's no safe testing. I don't care what they say. Everything vents. There's no safe testing. And so for our government to start entering into the process of testing again is just, it's beyond belief because they haven't cleaned up or taken care of what they did in the first place. And, you know, I'm closer to the end of my life than the beginning, but people like you are much closer to the beginning of your life than the end. And there's no way that young people shouldn't be engaged in this. This is, this is happening in our country. And to spend trillions of dollars on this again, when we, when we don't take care of all the people living in the streets, and you know we can't provide adequate education or funding for education or health care <laughs> why would anyone think that that's okay absolutely <clears throat> i know that i know that a mass mobilization around nuclear weapons and peace is definitely possible we had it in the 80s we have a mass mobilization of young people around climate change which is intrinsically tied to this, um, not only for just the general fact that nuclear weapons threaten sustainability in every way, but the fact that a use, multiple uses of nuclear weapons would lead to nuclear winter, which is the most severe climate change the world would ever experience. And I'm optimistic. I hope that these two issues can be tied together and there can be just as much outreach and advocacy because I do think the government gets away with it because people don't know. As soon as people people become educated and aware, it's much harder to continue funding these ways, these things. I, I don't didn't even know that there was new plans for testing in Nevada. Um, and that <laughs> how absurd is it that that kind of information is kept on the down low? I also so really totally, so totally. And the only reason that, you know, we're aware is because the local newspaper prints these articles. And I always tell everybody, don't you think it's interesting how they give it to us in these really small doses, some, pardon the pun, but in these small doses that we can sort of digest and then they tell us a little more and then we digest it, then they tell us a little more. And when they give it to us in those small doses like that, we don't realize how enormous it is. Mm -hmm. But this is big. We're in the middle of a nuclear arms race and we're gonna test nuclear devices again. Most people have no clue about that. I also really appreciate the way that you said you didn't wanna be an alarmist. I don't think this is being an alarmist in the slightest and I can tell that your your concern and the 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 work you've been doing for decades is not rooted in fear it's rooted more in a love of your community and of, of the world at large and i think that that's really what we need for a successful movement yes there has to be a decent understanding of the threat and that involves some amount of fear of not wanting things to go down that road but it really comes down to a love of each other and of our planet and I see that in you, and I'm so inspired. <laughs> well, thank you, Anastasia. But you, 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 um, you know, you inspire me because it's young people like you that are going to really affect change. It's young people like you that are going to, and I don't want it to sound cliche, but it is young people that will finally get our government to listen. Um, because I don't, I, I just believe that it has always been the way our politics work. That it, I mean, right now, in this moment, everybody's talking about the campus protests. It's only through these sorts of efforts that we finally see real change. Um, 
you know, when I look around me and we always laugh because, you know, a lot of times we call ourselves the gray hairs because we're all old people who have a full understanding of what this means because we have a lived experience. And, and I think young people have not had that yet. So to have somebody like you take such a huge interest in this simply because you understand how horrific this is and how futile it is and how insane it is to pursue these things that are nothing more than destructive. There's not, I always tell everybody, there's nothing good that comes out of this. There are no winners. And so, you know, please keep up the fight that you work on. Please keep up bringing a voice to this, a young, thoughtful voice to this. Thank you. I will. And I look forward to so many more conversations with you in the future. Absolutely. Thank you.